the polar vortex is beginning to lose its strength, and with it comes the possibility of a new ice age. The term stratospheric polar vortex, which has received a lot of attention from the media in recent years, despite the fact that it is sometimes used wrongly, refers to a seasonal high-altitude atmospheric structure that emerges in the fall, becomes more consolidated in the winter, and then dissipates in the spring. Its progressions and shifts away from the vertical axis of polar latitudes are frequently to blame for unexpected alterations in the tropospheric circulation. Changes that, particularly in the past few years, have resulted in an abrupt expansion of polar air towards mid-latitudes locations. The polar vortex is a structure that can be seen on other worlds as well. In the past, it has played a significant part in determining the climatic history of the Earth particularly in the last 2.5 million years, which has been defined by a sequence of recurrent glacial periods and shorter interglacial periods. In the past, it has also played a significant role in the evolution of life on Earth. Because of the caprices of the polar vortex, we are in the fortunate, or unfortunate, position to periodically experience what the typical weather conditions were like during the most recent glacial maximum. This may be both a blessing and a curse. On a brief timeline, it is possible for us to recreate the environment that existed on Earth 20,000 years ago. There is, however, a threat in the background, and that is the chance that the polar vortex would disintegrate irreversibly over the course of time. Some predict that this might happen within a few of decades at the most, which would lead to not only the rare dangerously cold weeks, but rather to a permanent ice age. Do you think it's likely, or do you think it's just possible? Let's make an effort to understand everything that's going on here. This question is mostly aimed at people who live in regions that are located at intermediate latitudes, such as the northern United States or northern Europe. However, the answer to this question is sure to be familiar to you. For instance, you go to bed on an ideal night, only to discover that when you wake up, it is already semi-frozen outside. The unpleasant surprise occurs when you look outside and find your car buried under a half meter of snow and covered in ice. At that moment, you undoubtedly hurried to the television in quest of news, only to hear your favorite meteorologist humorously explain that the cause of your small surprise was the abrupt disintegration of something called the polar vortex. In reality, the majority of people are likely to have learned about the polar vortex for the first time in January 2014, when temperatures dropped to extremely low temperatures in some locations, even reaching a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius below zero. Do you still recall it? Because the weather was so severe, the schools in the state of Minnesota were shut down so that the children wouldn't have to be exposed to the bitterly cold temperatures. However, it's possible that we don't need to go back quite that far in time. Even in December 2022, the United States was hit by an unusually cold spell, accompanied by snowstorms and temperatures that caused at least 63 people to lose their lives. The same thing took place in February 2021 in the state of Texas, when the state recorded some of the coldest temperatures in the previous 30 years. As a result, at least 250 individuals passed away as a direct result of the conditions. As a matter of fact, for the past few years now, and apparently in contrast to the predictions made by proponents of global warming, the United States has been experiencing sudden drops in temperatures during the winter season. As a matter of fact, as that meteorologist mentioned earlier, these occurrences are linked to the Arctic vortex which is an expansive low-pressure area that looms over the North Pole. And even though it seemed like a new phenomenon to the majority of us at the time, scientists had been studying the polar vortex for at least three decades, so they knew all there was to know about it. What exactly is a polar vortex? A vast low-pressure area that is semi-permanent at higher altitudes above the North Pole is referred to as the polar vortex in meteorology. This zone of low pressure is also known as the Arctic Vortex. It is significantly more powerful than any other low pressure area, and it is present virtually continually, particularly throughout the winter season. 
if we take into account the fact that low-pressure regions that affect Central Europe can have a diameter of 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers, or even more, which is not exactly a short distance, then in this instance, we are talking about a vortex that encompasses the entirety of the Arctic Circle and has its center located roughly over the North Pole. It has the potential to reach the middle latitudes and has a diameter that is much greater than 5,000 kilometers. A vortex is a formation that normally forms in the stratosphere at an altitude that ranges anywhere from 12 to 50 kilometers, which is located above the troposphere and the tropopause, which is where the majority of the atmosphere's processes take place. But this vortex at higher altitudes frequently has an effect on the lower levels of the troposphere as well, particularly when it is strong, which results in the formation of a tropospheric polar vortex. In the field of meteorology, there is a contrast between the tropospheric vortex and the stratospheric vortex. The tropospheric vortex has a greater influence on the air masses that are closer to the ground. The stratospheric vortex normally begins to form in September, achieves its greatest intensity in January and February, and then begins to dissolve in late April or early May. This is in contrast to the tropospheric vortex, which is more or less present throughout the year. This circulation can be visualized as a gigantic spinning top that is situated over the North Pole and is packed with icy air. It has a ground level and a first floor, just like a house would, giving it the appearance of a two-story building. In this scenario, the term ground floor refers to the troposphere, which is the space that stretches from the surface of the Earth up to a height of approximately 10 kilometers and is where the meteorological events that are frequently the subject of our research take place. The stratosphere, which extends up to an altitude of approximately 50 kilometers and is separated from the troposphere by a ceiling known as the tropopause, is located on the first floor, which is significantly higher than the other floors. If we were able to watch all of this from a vantage point in space located above the North Pole, we would witness a roughly circular cyclonic zone with air masses moving in a counterclockwise direction and its boundary would be fringed by more or less noticeable undulations. In the field of meteorology, undulations of this kind are also referred to as Rossby waves. Another vortex, which is located above the South Pole and is known as the Antarctic Vortex, can also be found in that region, however we are going to talk about that region again later. Then what is it that stops this vortex from continuing to move or grow indefinitely? In most cases, the Arctic vortex is kept confined over the North Pole by a so-called warmer jet stream. What exactly are these things called jet streams? A very fast wind that, like the rim of a bowl, acts as a barrier between the Arctic vortex and the rest of the atmosphere. Because it is colder and denser at the center, the air there is essentially contained within this bowl of warmer air. It is not very easy for it to go over the edge. Or at the very least, this is not the case the majority of the time. When temperatures in the Arctic rise, certain portions of the Arctic cold wind vortex have the potential to break through the border of the bowl, going beyond the typical constraints of the jet stream and reaching continental regions. The polar vortex might appear to be a reasonably dependable natural system for managing the climate in either hemisphere, however this is not the case. In actual case, though, it's not quite as flawless as it seems. To begin, the edge of the vortex, which is defined by jet streams, is not round but rather wavy. This waviness includes edges where cold air overflows and lowers in latitude, and indentations where warm air from lower latitudes strives to approach the pole. Likewise, the high speed winds that make up the barrier that the polar vortex creates can, at times, have varying degrees of severity. If these winds diminish to an excessive degree, it has the potential to distort the vortex and make its boundaries even more irregular, which will result in the escape of pockets of cold air. Even while it is warmer than the ordinary Arctic winds, the air that leaks out from beyond the bowl's boundaries is still extremely frigid. This warmth could yet result in significant snowfall, similar to what has just occurred in Texas, which is devoid of mountain ranges that provide protection, or what happened in Europe two years ago. Although talking about it, 
Why does the cold air that is overflowing from the bowl of the vortex wreak devastation in places like Canada and the United States, but not in Europe? Latitudes in North America and Europe are comparable. For example, New York City is located at a latitude that is similar to that of Naples. However, it is extremely uncommon for both continents to be struck at the same time by a cold wave, and winter storms of this type are significantly more common and severe in North America. There are a lot of different things that could have caused these differences. To begin, the air that makes its way to Europe does not go across Canada, but rather the North Atlantic, despite the fact that the polar vortex can also have an effect on Europe. In the winter, the air over land masses is generally cooler than the air above oceans. This is especially true in the north of Europe because of the warm Gulf Stream. It is mostly due to this stream why the climate of northern Europe is significantly more temperate than that of Canada and of North America in general. The influence of cold ocean currents, on the other hand, can be felt along the coasts of North America. On the other hand, Europe has the Gulf Stream and the Mediterranean Sea, which together provide yet another heat reservoir. The presence of mountains is another factor that contributes to the greater vulnerability of North America to the cold air that flows in from the north. The Rocky Mountains, which run from British Columbia in Canada all the way down to New Mexico in the United States, do not function as a barrier to the northern winds. Rather, they play a role in directing these winds towards the east. The primary mountain range in Europe, the Alps, travels longitudinally, acting as a barrier to cold air from the north and contributing to Italy's warm temperature by running parallel to the continent's longitudinal axis. The Ural Mountains run in a longitudinal direction and form a natural boundary between European and Asian Russia. In spite of this, they also play a function in blocking cold air, notably the icy mass that originates from Siberia, which is the closest large cold continental expanse to the west. However, because Siberia is located so much further away from Europe than the distance that separates the northernmost parts of Canada and the United States, it is not able to exert a constant influence on the climate of Europe. Obviously, the question that everyone is wondering, and you might be wondering it too at this point, is whether or not the polar vortex is influenced by climate change. Rising temperatures can, in fact, contribute to anomalies in the polar vortices, which can then result in unexpectedly cold spells, according to proponents of the global warming idea. There is a possibility that the reason lies in the fact that throughout the summer months, larger amounts of Arctic sea ice are melting away. The Arctic Ocean is warming up, which causes it to send more heat into the atmosphere during the winter. The winds that act as a barrier between these regions are weakened as a result of this warmth, because it lessens the contrast between the air in the Arctic and the atmosphere further south. In response, this causes the polar vortex to become more fragile and disorganized. This idea is supported by data collected over the course of the previous decade, which shows that the vortex has a greater propensity to weaken in years where a large chunk of Arctic sea ice is accelerating its retreat. It is important to point out that the assumption that changes in Arctic sea ice might influence the stability of the polar vortex to such a degree is not shared by all individuals. But if that were accurate, there would certainly be cause for alarm because the quantity of Arctic sea ice changes from year to year, and in recent years, it has been disappearing at a speed that has been getting faster and faster. If the ice in the Arctic were to melt at an even more rapid rate, then bigger quantities of fresh water would flow into the Atlantic Ocean. This would cause a change in the salinity of the ocean, as well as a severe disruption of the well-known conveyor belt process that allows the Gulf Stream to warm northern Europe and North America. This may result in a significant deterioration of the climate in the northern hemisphere, as well as alterations in the movement of air in the southern hemisphere. In addition, the albedo effect which is caused by sunlight reflecting off the white ice of the polar ice caps, has the potential to substantially reduce world temperatures. It is possible that if this pattern continues, the polar vortex in the Arctic will begin to collapse in on itself. This has the potential to bring about all of the prerequisites for the onset of a mini ice age in the northern hemisphere. 
It's challenging since it's possible that we'll have to face the fact that global warming might actually result in a significant decline in temperature, and not just during the colder months. To put it short, it would appear that the environmental destiny of our planet is still up in the air. Perhaps the most sensible course of action is to steer clear of anything that can set in motion climate mechanisms about which we have only a limited understanding. What do you think of that? As Bill Gates says, by the time we see that climate change is really bad, your ability to fix it is extremely limited. The carbon gets up there, but the heating effect is delayed. And then the effect of that heat on the species and ecosystem is delayed. That means that even when you turn virtuous, things are actually going to get worse for quite a while. You can suggest topics you want to see next in the comment section below. Please subscribe to Weather Collapse if you want to know more and be updated on the latest news about natural calamities or disasters happening all over the world, and don't forget to like today's video. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.